Hello, everybody. Welcome to Pearls of Wisdom. I'm in Sydney and I'm distinctly honoured and privileged to be joined by Jacques Branelec and his family in the Philippines. And Jacques is the president of the Philippine Association of Pearl Producers and Exporters, the president of Jewelmare Corporation and the chairman of the Pearl Producers Confederation of the Philippines. And right before I let Jacques speak and introduce him himself in his own words, I just want to, um, to read out of this beautiful book that Jack gave me when we met on one of our many Hong Kong trade fair and, and pearl auction times together. Um, and Jack wrote as a frontispiece of his beautiful book, each individual in this world has a mission to fulfill. Many of us are not aware of what we are here for, but I think mine was very clear since childhood. Growing up near the sea, which I feared yet respected for its might and admired for its wonder, I guess a divine hand guided me through most of this planet's oceans. To be, to be blessed to discover first in Tahiti, all the wealth and natural beauty sleeping in the atolls, black-lipped oysters, the black pearls, those that later became the main source of income for Polynesians. The same hand pushed me even more westward to the wonders of the Philippine seas, where I discovered with respect the unique gold-lipped oyster, which produced after many years of hardship the ultimate orient, the Philippine golden pearl, liquid gold with fire from within. Many wonderful people were met and efforts shared during this long journey. So Jacques, I must ask you to, uh, to start off and tell us where you were born, where you grew up and went to, went to school and university or what did you study? Yes, David, thank you so much for this opportunity to talk about what we love or passion, which is the cultural pearl and mainly the South Sea pearls. I, I guess I have to start uh, um, by giving a lot of credit to my father, which uh, was a, a resistance and World War II hero, um, because I think he escaped death a few times and even uh, uh, he was nearly uh, shot and aligned on the wall several times, then he escaped um, uh, prison, military prison several times. Then I, I remember that, well, I was born after the war, but I have met those people that we used to have a lot of Jewish family hidden in our house, in our, even in, in some special uh, hidden room in the house. So uh, when we came, I was the son of a war hero and person who would teach me a lot of bravery and never to let go. So that's, that's the root of the energy. He was also passionate by the sea, but he was in ready to wear a business, but his passion was to be a, a ship captain, but his family would not let him do so. So it's only later in his life that he became a um, very um, good sailor and he popularized and created sailing school in France, which was very new for people which were not necessarily from Richmond. So we give access to the sea to a lot of people at, uh, in the early 60s or 70s. And then he himself became Olympic champion of dragon competition. He was, uh, he was passionate by the sea. So maybe that's where the gene started. He also had um, oyster farm, which was his sideline. And that's where I would spend all the weekend and all the holiday in the mud up to my thigh carrying a uh, heavy, uh, that was child labor at the time, but it was politically correct for the children to work <laughs> in the family at the time. Where, where was that's that, where Jack? I, that's when I learned to have the feet cut by the, the sharp, you know, shell of the yeah. oyster and in the cold. <laughs> it was a very good apprenticeship. So I would say moving to the tropics was even lighter than the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> and where did you grow up, Jack? In, 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 in Brittany. South we are France or pure Brittany. Celtic, Celtic people and we live by the sea. We, we, only, we only are concerned by the weather, by the tide. By, so we are always looking you know, toward the horizon and looking it, where yes. we're going. We feel that call to go further west because we are yes. the western people of Europe. Yes. And did you go to school in, in Brittany? And then did you go to university? Or I, I think you became yes, a pilot, uh, well, but we must hear your story. 
Yeah, I'll, well, I was uh, studying biology and psychology in University of Rennes when the French student revolution of 1968 came. And um, I remember my university was burned. There was a lot of anarchists, uh, Trotskyists, or whatever you name it. And um, it was no exam, no, no schooling, nothing. That's the time I decided. I I was a working student, but I decided to shift to aviation because I didn't see any possibility even of graduating. So that's the time I became a commercial pilot um, during the during the revolution, the French Revolution of 1968, where the, yes. maybe you were born, that the president uh, de Gaulle had to resign at that time. I mean, it's been lost a little bit in history, but it was really a very dramatic uh, situation. So it's either you were joining the revolution or you were finding something creative. And that's what I did in becoming a pilot. Fantastic. So, does, does it take long to qualify to be a pilot? Yeah. Is it, yeah. It's quite a few years. Yes. And at that time, there was a lot of pilot on the market. It was not easy <laughs> to find a job until after writing something like 300 or 400 letters. I got a letter from Tahiti asking if I wanted to be a pilot in Air Tahiti. I didn't even finish the letter that I was already packing my bag. And actually, I left 48 hours after I was playing for the team. <laughs> wow. And when did you, when did you first um, fly into Tahiti then? That was in 1970. And, and, and can I ask how you made the transition from flying to pearls? What, what, what happened? Well, it was not uh, instantaneous. It was, um, well, first I, I was a junior pilot, so I had to get used to it. I did pretty well. And um, so we were, we were doing long flight over the Pacific without no equipment. There was no GPS, nothing at the time. It was really pioneering aviation, but very exciting. And um, I had developed, after doing the routine regular flights, I asked the possibility to organize charter flights for longer distance and having interaction with some remote islands. So that was agreed by, by my company. And I became the biggest client of my employer, Air Tahiti, at the time by having nearly everyday charter going all over the, the, the Polynesian archipelago, which is huge. So um, I had the chance to develop very close relationship with the remote community in the Tuamotu Atlas. Then we organized uh, flying, transporting uh, fresh fish to the market from those islands which had no market. They were visited maybe once a year by boat, so they had no, no buyer for their production. So I started bringing fish, then lobster. We used to go catching lobster at night, selling uh, and shipping them to Tahiti, selling them on the market. So it was tough, exciting. It was not 100% piloting. It was very exciting. And then to cut short the story, after, uh, after having done that for a while, I came across accidentally in the service de la pêche of Tahiti to an experiment that had been done by uh, Professor Muroi from Japan. And he had done some tested in Ikweru at all, I think in 1967 or 68, I'm not sure. And then he was able to produce some pearls. Then those pearls were brought in a safe in the Department of Fisheries and nothing never happened. It never interested anybody, nobody wanted it and, and uh, nobody you know, uh, thought of doing something about it. So the experiments of Muroy was that it was just sleeping and waiting for waking up. So the impression is that for many people is that when the black pearl came in Tahiti, the whole world and the whole market was accepting it immediately. I brought the first lots of pearl from Tahiti in Japan. Then the people said, this will never work because you only use black for funeral. And we use or reject of white pearls, we bleach them in black and we, we don't want and we don't need. And if you're going to invest in black pearl in Tahiti, you're going to fail and to be a ruin. So the true story is the Japanese were not supportive at the beginning. They became, when they saw that it was selling and it was recognized, 
But that was much later, I would say in the late 70s or early 80s, maybe, uh, that the, the Japanese started coming. It was Asai Pentax and uh, a few other people. But at the beginning, the first reaction, oh, we don't want black pearl. So we had to persevere. So I went back to, to, the, to the atoll and I, I was thinking if we manage to, to create the, this market, it would be fantastic for the economy of Polynesia, which was only yeah. exporting uh, copra, the, the copra uh, nuts. And it was not really, it was subsidized by the French government. So, and it was also at the same time during just the post era of uh, nuclear testing in, in French Polynesia. So the morale, the economy and the, the people were very, very down. So that's when I thought that the pearl would change the whole the whole perspective and they yes. were i was not alone they, they were um like a certain jackie rosenthal with coco chaz uh, then later i think bill reed was uh, invited he was a consultant from uh for the fisheries but at that time bill reed did not have the technology to produce Ron Pearl, he was mainly doing Mabe in Gambier Island. Yes. And then um, I, I guess those, we were the first people uh, trying to start and to, to create the, the product first and after to create a market for it. And that was a fantastic experience. So I was, uh, what, 22 years old. I had no capital or I had very limited, uh, you know, uh, finance. So I had to partner with um, a French uh, gentleman, a friend of mine. And unfortunately, that partner of mine uh, did, was in a reality, uh, creating a real, real estate project, which he couldn't sell and didn't do too well. So he did not keep his obligation to support me in financing and sold this share to Jean-Claude Brouillet, which had absolutely no knowledge in per culture. And, uh, told me at the initial stage, Jack, I don't understand anything. That's bold bearing business for me. Do the best you can, and then I leave it up to you, carte blanche. Then, um, so I worked very, very hard, and I, I, it was, I explained to you earlier, the end of atmospheric testing of a nuclear bomb. So I was given access to that exclusion zone. Yeah. That's where, where I was. I think the first civilian to have the right to access to space. Everybody say maybe you're going to be contaminated or whatever, but fortunately there was no contamination. And uh, up to date, I, I'm still healthy and alive. <laughs> and then this island have been left virgin for, for I think 20 years with no diving, no fishing. And it was full of oysters, natural oysters. Beautiful. So we were able to acquire for a very reasonable price and we had a fantastic first harvest. And then when my partner Jean-Claude at the time saw the, the harvest, his attitude uh, changed totally and he felt that uh, he didn't need me anymore. I was going to be diluted and become a 10% minor partner while I was the founder and the creator. And it didn't jive too well with my sense of ethics, business, and whatever. So um, forcibly, I, I sold my shares to him, not because I wanted, because I had no choice at the time. So that's how uh, tearfully I had to leave the, the Polynesia against my, my wish. I mean, with a heart broken. Yeah. Because I was not defeated yet. So. Maybe your next question, what did you do next? Well, uh, with the, and, how, and how did you get to the Philippines? Yes. Yeah, that's a long story. Then I went back to, to France and uh, with a little money that I had collected for my share, I was able to invest in a, in a boat, a sailing boat, diving boat, which was equipped for marine research. And then I went uh, around the world for two years after that. Uh, sailing, leaving France, crossing the Atlantic, Panama, going nearly every place there were oysters, trying to find. I stayed nine months in Haiti. I stayed uh, 
uh, in every island in the Pacific. I revisited Tahiti, but it was not, I mean, there was no, no more the same appeal because my, my company was already uh, running and doing well, which I was happy to see that my idea was very successful. Yes. So I pushed the Pacific, crossed all the Pacific, then it was uh, going to the ultimate Orient and sailing all around until I reached the Philippines. I don't mention all the uh, collision with whales in uh, near New Caledonia or near sinking near Australia. I mean, many things. So I finally reached yes. the, the Philippines where I met uh, a young uh, Filipino entrepreneur who was an uh, expert in um, coconut breeding. And he was a very passionate person with nature, plants, animals, and he was also a diver. And then we decided to try to do a pearl farm. So it was quite difficult for multiple reasons. The place was infested by crocodile. I mean, giant sporosus, the same you have in, in, uh, in Australia and also yes. um, a lot of sharks. And at the same time, uh, it was still in the Muslim South where there was uh, very conflict with the liberation front at the time. So. Uh, I had to, I had a lot of difficulty starting, but with the, with the help of my Filipino partner, Manuel Coaco, uh, we were able to organize diving operation in the Zulu Sea, which is the most dangerous up to now. No insurance company will cover you if you go there and you need a special permit from the Minister of Defense to go there at the time. And that's where we gathered the oyster and brought back to my partner island and started doing white pearl originally. We were not specific at the beginning on white pearl, but it was so dangerous and so risky that we faced a limit in the supply and risking our life for oyster up to a certain point, okay, but permanently and for the rest of the life. So we went into biotechnology. We started a, a laboratory and it took us 10 years to breed the Pintada Maxima. We were the first to breed the Pintada Maxima. We started in 1979. In 1989, we were able to produce in laboratory ahead of anybody else, including Australia or even Japan, sure. the Pintada Maxima shares. So that was the takeoff. Then we started, it was white pearl first, white, champagne, all kinds of natural color. And what and year then, did you have your um, what year did you have your first actual harvest? Oh, the first the, harvest the very was first. maybe nineteen eighty two. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But and that, and because of the because of the danger with the sharks and the crocodiles and the fighting around the oyster areas, yeah, you, yeah. you that, thought you had to go into hatchery production where it would be yeah, more safe. And, it was just physical safety. Yeah. Yes, but that at, at that time except table oyster hatchery, there was no pearl uh, oyster hatchery in the world. We were pioneering and we were the first successful on that species. So yes. it took us 10, 10 years to get the, 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 to succeed. It was not in three months or three years. It was 10 years to be able to breed. Then we were able to grow from one farm. We went to eight farm and then from, uh, I don't know, 50, or 30,000 oyster, we went to several million of oyster and employing up to at a certain time, close to 2,000 people. Fantastic. And Jack, so that's when we really, your, we went yes. to a bigger scale, yeah. And so your pearls really are, are so, so beautiful. All that, all that work you've done, your, your pearls of different colors and especially gold are, yeah. are so outstanding. I, I like the one around your neck. That's a very, that's a yeah. beautiful, serious pearl but you yeah, your, well, yours are the beautiful beautifulest of pearls for, for sure so it was all it was it was worth it but it's amazing isn't it how how so many stories in life come from great adversity and when things go yes. wrong it forces things to go right so so in a yeah. way the sharks and crocodiles helped you force you into the hatchery and then you're yeah. the, the world's pioneer of it yeah yeah, we skip the typhoon, we skip the pirates, we skip uh, or we skip every every detail. Yes. I mean, I call it detail looking back forward, but actually it was a fight for survival and it was never an easy an easy road. And then maybe you, you want to know 
how, but we're not talking yet of Golden Pearl. So no, when did, no. how did they come into the picture? Well, yes. I, rem I, remind, I remembered my experience in Tahiti with the, the resistance of the Japanese first saying Black Pearl will never work. I say, or oh, I'm going to use the same psycho-cybernetic. If they say it doesn't work, I'm going to make it work. And yes. then I came, the ID, I came with the idea that if we were able to produce natural golden pearls, I mean, something which is looking the color of the sun or the color of the most beautiful shell, uh, definitely it's so close to something which is not, um, how do you say, like an albino pearl because not bleach is really all the natural character, all the pigmentation yes. coming from the plankton, from the sun, from the efforts of the people, from the care given to the oyster. And then it took another 10 years to move from white to gold. And that that was so therefore 1989 per uh, 1999, where the golden pearl was born. And my Japanese were telling me the same that I had talked with Jackson, you know, don't go, everybody wants to buy white, don't go gold. I said, but there is so much production of white and it's so easy to make white. Gold is very difficult. Let I take a chance. No, 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 you're going to bankrupt. Don't go, don't go gold. And then I went gold and it was fantastic. <laughs> we got yes. the support of Mikimoto who was our, uh, among our first buyer. And they have always valued so much the natural uniqueness and character of the, of the Philippine South Sea, Golden South Sea Pearl that they give us the motivation to, to keep on fighting. And yes. then I, I believe in the natural character of an organic product, not something that is, you know, bleach or denatured or whatever sure. using any kind of technique. So it was a success. Uh, that's where we are. And uh, that was, yeah, 2000, uh, 1999, yeah. So. And, and Jacques, you, you also have built up a beautiful um, retail and, and wholesale production of, of beautiful, beautiful jewelry as well. And did you start that soon after 1999? No, no it started much earlier because, uh, because of the difficulty that we had first to succeed in the breeding, we needed to have income to be able, you know how capital uh, sure. intensive is the, the pearl culture. So, Jewelry was the way to help us to finance the farm. So we started jewelry as early as 1980s. And then uh, it was a very uh, interesting story. I got a teacher from Ecole du Louvre, I called uh, du Louvre de Jewelry in Paris, and brought yes. him over in, in the Philippines. And with my partner, Manuel Guanco, we went to high school in remote um, area to recruit student goldsmiths. So we, we started training them as early as, yeah, as early as uh, 1982 or 83. And then those people up to now are still with us there and they have reached a very high international level when we show that the people believe it comes from, uh, I don't know, well, the best uh, manufacturer in the world. So. We have been searching in, in the creativity and the design in the manufacturing and putting a lot of uh, emphasis on the hand, hand work, hand manufacture, not, not machine manufacture jewelry. So we created our uniqueness and through the years we participated, we participated to a lot of international event and we created a very strong brand of jewelry up to date, which is which is uh, another object of of pride because we started from zero and we became acknowledged uh, worldwide. Actually, fantastic. Yes. So it's a fa it's Jack. It's a it's a fantastic story of. Um, of the pioneer spirit that won't give up. And when people say to you, you can't do it after you studied psychology, it's a great, it's a great, um, a great way of pushing you forward in life, isn't it? And it is amazing how when things go wrong, 
sometimes yeah, it's it like they did in Tahiti. It's so it can go very right for you in the Philippines where you've had a whole life and family. Yes. And um, well, now I, I mean, I'm proud. You can see all of Finnish jewelry in, in the most prestigious places in Palm Beach or around yes. the world. And I mean, it's a, a very, very rewarding feeling to see, to, to know the story, the story of the community. It's not, it's not a business, it's, it's more of an adventure, a lifestyle. We have to learn in so many fields. We have to learn in, in this. We have to learn in biotechnology and genetics, reproductive. I mean, the field is so limited. The knowledge you have to be good in logistics. You have to be good in so many other fields to succeed in in uh, making a beautiful piece of jewelry. So uh, the excitement the excitement is still at 100% up to now. Fantastic, Jack. You're, you're, you're one of the living legends in our business, you know. And my, I've, we're, we're a bit running out of time, so I want to ask you about the next generation, if we can bring in your son, Jack Jr., as well. well uh, I, I must ask I, you both I, how, you, how you coped in, in the COVID time yeah, and what well, it's done to your business. Well, we bless because what's important is the continuity and, and the future. And uh, I have two of my daughter, one is in charge of the jewelry, the other one of the marketing. And Jack Christophe is in charge of the, of the production and at the same time, the, the export of, of the jewelry and the, the wholesale pearl. And uh, it, it's not easy to work in a family, but it, I think it came spontaneously and maybe we can ask uh, uh, Jack Christophe. Um, yes, please, own... please do join us. Yes. Push, push your, your father aside a bit. <laughs> Hi, Jack Hi. Christophe, welcome. How are you? Really good, it's so, it's so lovely talking, talking with your dad and talking, and talking with you too. And we've interviewed a few people around the world and I always ask about what's the future and what would you say to young people? But while you're with us, can I first ask you how you've coped with COVID? It's like everybody's had a very difficult 2020 and how have you managed you guys? Yeah, I think um, in line with what you said earlier, David, I think uh, with adversity, there's also many uh, blessings that come along the way, perhaps that we would not have seen uh, in normal times. So I think, uh, COVID, yes, it has been challenging, but at the same time, it's allowed for many opportunities and areas for us to grow in which we perhaps wouldn't have explored in the past. In another way, it's also allowed us to really get closer to the people we work with on a day-to-day -day basis, because with this pandemic, you know, we're all risking our lives to ensure the livelihood and sustainability of the group. So I yes. think that that, that loyalty dedication um, really grows the bond strong. Fantastic, and 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 the big question I ask at the end, Jack, is is um, how you see the future and what you'd say to young people who are contemplating coming into the into the pearl business. And so I would, I, I must ask you that too, how you see the future. Yeah, you want the sun to start first, maybe? And then I'll, um, yeah, yes, I'll please. The yeah. Well, um, I believe you also have uh, succeeding generations in, in your family. In fact, I think it's Charlie's birthday today. Yes, we'll say happy birthday, Charlie Barron, who's yeah, 26 birthday, today, Charlie. and he's the sixth member of our family in a row since 1830 to be a pearl man yeah there you go so i think um i have met a lot of the, the people of my generation in the pearl industry and having grown around such a inspiring business um and and of course being around such a beautiful environment i think gives us a rare opportunity when things are going you know, more in a digital direction and, you know, 
uh, away from nature, so to speak. Uh, I think we're very lucky that we are able to recharge ourselves in such wonderful environments with such a natural product. So in terms of what can I share uh, for people outside the pearl industry, um, I think we cannot put enough value in the importance of having a relationship with nature um, and being able to, to sustain um, its beauty uh, for, for, for many more generations to come, hopefully. I'm so with you all the way. Thank you, thank you. And Jack Senior, you must have the last word, sir, what you would say to yeah. the next generations. Well, first, uh, if you want to get involved in the Pearl, you, you have to be prepared to enter a very challenging, energetic journey in which you will be rewarded at every step. You will be rewarded by your interaction with multiple community. In my case, I have learned so much from my Japanese friend, my Polynesian friend. I have half of my heart is still left in the Tuamotus there forever. The other half, I brought it here. And we learn all the time, we interact, we make a difference in the life of other people, mostly in very remote area. In most of the case, in places where there would be no other alternative of uh, economic development. So we create um, a stimulus economically and environmentally also the Pearl Farm presence uh, deter a lot of illegal activity which destroy coral, which allow illegal fishing mainly in the developing countries and people who, who just are want to get what they can today and don't care about tomorrow. So we have a role to play in educating the community and protecting nature. So uh, is it a boring life? No way. Is it a routine? No way. Is it an easy life? Not at all, but so many rewards. And the unique, the, the, the queen is that the ultimate orient is is the gem that you're rewarded. I mean, it's a nearly a mystical experience. The energy of the sun produces plankton, then this plankton, which is which varies in every country and every part of the world, will feed an animal. That animal will get its unique character and coloration and will give this to a wonderful gem that he carries in, in his uh, core. Wow, I mean, it's it's full circle. It's the sun going back to the sun. I mean, uh, now we we see those days. People are already in March, but uh, uh, we should never lose contact with the beauty and with the with the uniqueness of a growing pearls and staying in a beautiful nature that we have to preserve for the next generation. Thank you so much. That's a really beautiful description of of our life in, in pearls and just the, the life cycles of nature and everything. And I must thank you both very, very much. It's been really, really wonderful being with you today and, and learning about you and your life and your business. So, so thank you so much. Uh, there is a unique bond, David, between all the people who appreciate pearls. And not only that, we are conveying love and aesthetics and respect of uh, a soft nature. It's nothing hard sell, it's nothing, you know, imposed. It's all subtle and it's the result of a lot of affection and dedication. If you are not in love with the pearl, you can produce them. So whether there are any color in particular, there is always a woman, a woman which will find her happiness in carrying a pearl. The energy of the pearl changes the person who, the, the, who carries it. One single pearl, a single panda, you, you can see a glow on the face of any human being. And that's our dream to have every woman on the planet to carry a pearl so she can fulfill our femininity at the most. Thank you, David, to give us this opportunity to share our friendship. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jacques, Jacques Christophe, too. So beautiful. Bye.